And so the idea is Catholic priests in the Middle Ages had unique sets of powers. Well, if you could throw a demon out of someone with the right evocations and invocations and incantations, and couldn't you also bind those demons? And if you could bind them, you could also control them. And what could you control them to do? Well, what do demons know? They know all kinds of weird secrets. They have all kinds of powers. At what point do you cross the line to making deals with demons? At what point do you cross the line from controlling them to maybe they're controlling you? And this is what Augustine always famously says, that anytime anyone thinks they're controlling a demon, the demon's just playing them, and eventually they're gonna kill their soul or what have you. Priests, basically, ostensibly, were learning to bind and control demons. Now, clearly, you don't go to seminary and get that lesson. <laughs> and you definitely don't go to seminary and teach that lesson. And we know of at least a couple of people who skirted that line and they got burned. Uh, Cecco d'Ascoli is a famous example in the 14th century. We were watching that the Pythagoreans believe that, uh, that reality was number. What Everything around you is actually just numbers. And one of their members actually discovered irrational numbers. And this so devastated the Pythagoreans that they assassinated him. It was a cult. So they killed the guy uh, over the, his discovery of irrational numbers. They did not want the idea that the universe could be in any way irrational. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm the host, Derek Lambert, and the guest I have on today is going to blow my mind, including yours. I'm not making this up. Dr. Justin Sledge, and he has a YouTube channel, Esoterica. We'll get there. Welcome to Myth Vision. Thank you, Derek. I really appreciate you uh, having me on. Looking forward to our, our conversation, which I think will get a little weird, but good weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I really do appreciate you coming on. I checked out your YouTube channel just for everybody who's interested. Let me pop that up so they can go and subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure you hear that bell ding, if you will. That way you're notified every time he drops a video. I promise you, I promise you, if you watch these videos, any of these videos, you're going to fall in love. You're going to go, I learned so much. It's just full of it. I mean, I, I watched two full videos today and I was like, okay, I know where I'm binge watching when I get an opportunity. This is a YouTube channel I want to go to. Can you tell us a little bit more about your YouTube channel? Sure. It's it's a uh, place, one of the few places actually on the internet that I know of with a few exceptions that uh, I create content on the academic study of uh, esotericism. And I know we're going to get a little bit into what esotericism means but um, sort of a wide range of things. You can see some of the curated playlists there on alchemy, hermetic philosophy, Gnosticism, Kabbalah, magic, but it's all being done from an academic scholarly viewpoint. So we don't uh, deal with you know, conspiracy theories or I'm the ascended master who has all the secrets. And if you just pay me, <laughs> I'll tell you how to uh, get your, you know, how to get a girlfriend or whatever. So it's, an, it's the academic study of esotericism um, and I, we really range all the way back to the ancient Near East through the late classical period. So it covers a wide range of periods. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's one of the few channels um, on the Internet that covers the academic study of Western esotericism. I can echo that this channel is worth watching. Trust me, go check it out. He also has a personal website. Who's this young stud right here on this? Yeah, that was me on my wedding day, if you believe that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, man, the beard is awesome. Um, yeah. You also have the Patreon. I hope anyone who watches his videos, just so you know, once you get on there, do you offer anything? What are you, what are you offering with the Patreon? So the main thing on Patreon is you'll get ex, you'll get direct access basically to, to me in terms of like things like one-on-one -on -one study and you'll get early access to videos. You'll get to vote on future videos. We just have a really cool community of folks who are just a really wide range of everyone from occult practitioners, people who really, this is their worldview, all the way to skeptics who are just interested in this academically. And it's a really cool place to have a conversation between those parties. And also, if you're interested in studying this stuff more deeply, we have private hangouts and study sessions and, and things like that. So, you know, mm. kind of typical Patreon stuff, but uh, pretty untypical content, I think, under the hood. Yeah. So uh, in that way, I think folks might uh, benefit from that. And also, it's just an opportunity to support the work of making uh, content that is um, 
basically unavailable uh, in at the university level in a scholarly way. It's almost you can't take classes on this stuff in most universities, and it's one of the few places online where um, I'm able to put content out given the academic specialty that I have. So it's also just supporting the work of of making things um, like alchemy and uh, the occult um, knowledge about that stuff accessible because most of what you would see online is let's call it really uneven. <laughs> let's yeah. call it really uneven. So, well, I, I must say, uh, all of that is down in the description. So be sure to check it out. Um, Dr. Sledge, I'm going to try and call you doctor here. Cause that's what I usually do, but I almost want to say Justin, cause I feel no. so close. Yeah. Um, can, Justin's totally fine. <laughs> the, the doctor stuff is great for formal stuff, but at, at the end of the day, I'm just some guy that makes weird videos for the internet. Well, these weird, <laughs> weird videos are what drew me to start my channel. And so I just want to mention that when I got into this, before I started Myth Vision, I found an attraction to esoteric thinking or at least alternative uh, interpretive models, astrology, understanding how that might connect with, you name it. Uh, are these stories really astrological rather than literal historical? What are the meanings? Because my interpretations wasn't literal anymore. I started right. to find the Bible meaning something else, maybe. Long story short, I ended up in a situation where I, I ended up finding sacred geometry. And I wanted to get into that and find out, like, is there something going on with sacred geometry? There's a lot of mathematics and things that play a role. I think that ties into some of the things we might discuss today, but that's what got me drawn. And there's a channel called Sacred Geometry Decoded. Don't know if you've ever heard of it. I haven't. No, no, I haven't okay. heard of it. Well, that's where I started, like talking to this guy. And I just started Myth Vision. And I was just like, interesting, figuring my way out. The question is, what is esotericism? And if you don't mind, take us into it. Yeah. So esotericism, uh, we can think about a kind of dichotomy within religion and philosophy where there are the uh, exoteric teachings of a religion or a philosophy, right? So that's what gets taught to the hoi polloi. That's, that's what's gets uh what get broadcast to the the masses so that's the exoteric right. thinking that's what yeah right that's what that's what all the normies get right but in the interior of many of these ancient schools for instance in ancient greece or ancient egypt there were secret teachings that were only available to folks who were initiated in um into those circles and there was in many uh in many uh, of these ancient schools a pledge to silence that you had to remain silent and the fact the word esotericism uh, uh, or mystery actually has the word silence kind of built into it. Mm. And so the expectation was that you would be initiated into a private circle and you'd be taught the true deeper meaning of uh, either religious texts, things like Hesiod's um, uh, origin of creation or the Bible or what have you. And so the esoteric is this hidden inner dimension of uh, ph philosophy, of religion and, and things like that. And so what we think of when we think about this in a broad way, when we think about sort of Western esotericism in general, is we kind of formulate it as either repressed forms of thought. So this would be things like uh, magic or alchemy uh, or uh, things that have been lost or rejected as wisdom. So this would be something like astrology, perhaps Gnosticism was ultimately rejected as heterodox. And so what we have is kind of a basket and, you know, a kind of loose fitting basket, a basket nonetheless of arcane things from history. This would cover a wide range of things from uh, alchemy, Kabbalah, mysticism, magic, uh, the occult. Um, astrology gets also grouped in there, and theosophy is another thing that gets grouped in there as well. So in some ways, Western esotericism is the grab bag that captures all of that repressed thought and practice, and also things that have been rejected as thought and practice. And so Western esotericism captures all of that, and so on my channel, we kind of go through a circuit of, you know, there'll be an alchemy video, there'll be a magic video, there'll be, and we, you know, we'll look at things like medieval uh, necromancers manuals, and we'll look at how exactly one practiced, for instance, demonic or black magic in the Middle Ages. But again, from an academic point of view, you know, I'm not going to teach you how to summon demons. I don't think that's, <laughs> um, do that at your own risk. Yeah. So, a little bit about your background as we get into this. You are a PhD. You have right. you're an expert when it comes to this particular milieu, this little uh, this little zeitgeist of uh, ideas, if you will. Um, what is your personal background, just so that people understand where you're coming from? Because they're probably seeing the beard, and they're saying, 
this guy's like really believing in this literally yeah, this, this, and this guy's a kabbalist he's a rabbi or something right uh so i'm not a rabbi and it I'm wouldn't just... be a problem if you were i'm no I'm no just i think saying, by the way. no i think that i say this that uh religious people do work on religion sometimes really well and sometimes really badly and sometimes non-religious people do really good work on religion and sometimes they do really bad work mm -hmm. uh, i think that uh that that those two things don't imply each other um, but yeah, I have a, uh, a PhD in philosophy and I have uh, uh, an advanced degree of doctorandus in uh, Western esotericism. So my focus in my academic career is, is this sort of uh, this batch of ideas, this batch, this strange bundle of things. So I, unlike many people who study Western esotericism, I study it from the philosophical angle. Uh, most people are historians and so they study it as a piece of history. I tend to be more interested in the ideas that undergird it. How do these? How did someone come to these conclusions, and how do they argue for these beliefs? So I'm much more interested in, in that angle of the of the history, I suppose. In in the continued existence, there's still people out there practicing magic, but um, to make it very clear, I'm not a practitioner of uh, of any esoteric occult belief system. I'm um, I'm just a civilian. You know, I happen to be a uh, a religious Jewish person of a of a certain type, a certain strange type, and I know I look like I'm, you know, uh, Haredi or whatever, or very religious. And I, I would consider myself religious, but I would not consider myself religious in an orthodox uh, sense of it. I actually belong to the Reconstructionist movement in Judaism, and I'm uh, for folks out there who know something about Reconstructionism. Uh, I'm philosophically very aligned with uh, Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan of Blessed Memory, so that's my. That's my go-to Rebbe is uh, Mordecai Kaplan. And so he had a very peculiar form of uh, Judaism. He was excommunicated, I think. Uh, so yeah. uh, you're not having fun until you get kicked out. So. Yeah, you're not. I've been excommunicated. <laughs> we finally, you know, we're getting somewhere. Yeah, you know, if you get kicked out, you're having fun. So you're doing something. You're pissing someone off. You're doing something right. Well, thank you for giving us that background. You didn't have to, but I really appreciate that. As far as esotericism goes, talking about, these various uh, tools that are being used by humans. How far back can you talk about its origins as far as we know, recorded wise, that this comes up? When, where does it start and how far back does this begin that we know of? Yeah, so it's a great question. And it, it, and it seems very likely that it probably goes back before there was civilization. It's very likely that there was always a case where the local shaman would have certain kinds of things he would tell the population but of course, the shamans themselves had secret information, for instance, how to travel to the spirit realm or, or what have you. So I suspect that that insider outsider um, esotericism, exotericism divide has probably existed as long as there's been technologies that people wanted to keep secret or, or at least keep close to their chest, so to speak. But the main place that we see it really beginning to emerge as a kind of institutional way of passing knowledge along is actually in ancient Greece, where we have these mystery religions in which uh, you have to be initiated in and then you're told the mysteries and you're sworn to secrecy although people didn't often keep the secrecy uh, alcibiades famously uh, uh leaked some of the elunician mysteries and uh, was much uh, much uh, hated for that um we also know for instance that uh, other philosophical schools like plato's school there seems to be pretty good evidence that Plato taught one thing in public and then taught something else in private. So yeah, we have these secret teachings of Plato that he alludes to and he hints at, and we're fairly confident they really existed. What they were is a lot, there's a lot of debate about them. And so what we have is, um, are these, again, this, this sort of what you tell the crowd and what's going on on the inside. And that seems to be something that develops primarily in the, in the ancient Greek environment, but I'm sure it existed in other cultures as well. Anywhere there's a, a priestly caste who has a unique connection to the gods and and you don't have it because you're just a you know unclean normal person um that's an that's an insider outsider thing and you can even see this um i think one of the more interesting examples that's emerged recently is um for instance in the dead sea scrolls it's very clear that some of the dead sea scrolls are not only meant for the elite but they're actually written in a cryptic script they're actually encoded so that literally, even if you read Hebrew, you could not read them by looking at them because they're they're literally encoded. And uh -huh. um, there's a small collection of encrypted, um, uh, in fact, there's three different codes that we've discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls, where clearly they're not only trying to uh, prevent outsiders from understanding their texts, but they're encoding them so that even insiders uh, can only have limited access to them. So I think that this is a, a, a this is a pattern. You know, the Church of Latter Day Saints has an, this very strong insider outsider dimension where you have to be brought into the temple and things like that. 
Um, so it's, I think it goes back really far, maybe back even before history, but certainly it becomes institutionalized in the ancient Greek setting. And we see that kind of thing perpetuating itself all the way through the late classical period. And it survives till now. I mean, one can think of an organization, for instance, like the Freemasons, in which uh, one has to be invited in and then one undergoes various kinds of initiation processes in order to be revealed the various uh, secrets of things of, of Freemasonry or other kinds of occult societies that have existed and, and still do exist. It's really interesting, your point is well put. You know, we see that with the inner Holy of Holies where only mm -hmm. the priest can go and touch and see and s stuff like that. Um, yeah, there seems to be this, at least a proto version of what developed really well over time. Um, do you think that Christianity in the earliest sense uh, comes out of something like this? There are people who try to argue, for example, that it may come from mystery cults. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that early institutional Christianity certainly wanted to be able to create an insider outsider division. And I think baptism was the initiation. It was the it was the that's what that's how you transitioned in into this inner circle. And so I think that, yeah, I think that they in many ways, they structured their religion um, a bit like a mystery religion, such that you would get access to um, to the sort of inner teachings, inner salvation through the initiation of uh, of baptism which is again a really interesting move on the part of early christianity where this um this ritual the mikvah ritual right the immersion ritual which was uh, in you know common in the ancient jewish world was transformed to become the centerpiece of the initiatory uh aspect of christianity and then it was only after that that you could you know enjoy the the eucharistic host and become part of the institution of christianity so certainly it had a it had an it, it had an, an inner an inner out, you know, it had a, an insider outsider division to be sure. Um, and of course, other forms of Christianity took that to even greater extent. So we can think of, for instance, the, the Gnostics for whom it seems very clear that they, um, that they did not teach their teachings to the outside world at all and reserved them exclusively for the, the elect that they felt were capable of receiving them. In fact, many Gnostics actually believe the Valentinians, for instance, believed that the, that human beings were just inherently divided. And some people just couldn't receive the mysteries and some people could. And so in that way, it was hyper elitist, I think, mm -hmm. in a way that even uh, proto-Orthodox Christianity uh, wasn't. Yeah, you you talk about a lot of this stuff in your videos that I want everybody to go and check out. Y you know, someone brought this to my attention. I don't know why we're, why we're in the Christian bubble for a second. Um, someone mentioned that, and there are scholars with various views, so... You know, I might have an opinion this week and next week something else is convincing me or something else. That's just the kind of data we're dealing with with uh, New Testament studies. But that Mark might reflect a Marcionite or even a Gnostic uh, idea. I mean, he he thanks God that he hasn't revealed these things to anyone. Um, he's glad God's hiding them from others. He speaks in parables. He doesn't want them to know the secrets or to even know what he's saying. Um, right. There's even, they're asking for signs. He's not giving them signs. He's keeping it completely exclusive to his inner group. And even the inner group doesn't get it. Doesn't get it. Yeah. That's, yeah. And this is what makes Mark famous, I think, in many ways. Of course, it's the earliest in the, in the synoptics. And it also portrays Jesus as a kind of reluctant Messiah who's not quite really, he certainly, he certainly doesn't want it to be known, right, that he's the Messiah and maybe even a reluctant Messiah at that. But yeah, I mean, I think that Mark, um, clearly has the idea that the teachings of Jesus were reserved for a very tiny group of people and that the, the parables, right? That Jesus would teach in parables, but teach something else to his inner circle. That's clearly an esoteric, exoteric um, um, dimension. And of course, the whole gospel in Mark is a secret thing. And there's constantly the, the secrecy and the hiding, as you mentioned. Uh, and of course, you know, in the, in the centuries that followed, certain kinds of Christians took that to heart <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, yeah, it is secret and, and y'all don't have access to it. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I think that, um, and I think I've talked about this before is that, you know, the aftermath of early Christianity, the early Jesus movement, they're not quite sure what any of this means. And so we get this sort of explosion of Christianities of which, um, you know, this sort of secret doctrine of, of Mark, uh, is, is one. And I think it did get legs and I think it, it did very well in the form of, uh, various kinds of, of Gnosticism. I don't know that I would inherently link it to Marcionism. Right, um, right, right. I mean, Marcy has a very particular axe to grind about the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. 
uh, and he really likes um, Paul to the yeah. chagrin of everything else. So I don't know if I would inherently link it to Marcionism, but I think that the idea that the secret that the teachings of Jesus were inherently secret and reserved for a tiny elite, um, people may bristle at that, but that would be completely unsurprising given the the social dynamics of how knowledge production happened uh, in the first century. Following up one more thing, and then we can go into anything else you'd be interested in telling us about esotericism is that I had this hunch from Steve Mason, and other academics. I wrote an article that will be published on Bart Ehrman's blog sometime soon. And I made the, I make the jump to say well, the reason he doesn't resurrect and appear and the women went and told no one for they were afraid. And that ends terrified. Yeah. Right. Um, is probably a jab at the 12. The 12 never get it. They're dimwits. That's why Mar uh, Matthew comes in and makes them all understand. Matthew right. has the disciples get it. Mark has him not get it. He wants right. to fix the problem. And he's and just, I'm, and only the women are there. Yeah. Yeah. It's only the women there. The, the disciples are, they've scattered because uh, they know what's good for them. They'll string him up. They'll string the rest up too. Yeah. I just made this jump and thought maybe this is a pro Pauline gospel trying to say, as Paul says over and over to who they were, that doesn't matter to me. Like right. it doesn't matter. These super apostles, like this jab over and over to the 12, like they don't get it. They backstabbed him according to this contract they made in Galatians 3, it seems. They sent spies on him. Like he is he, like, he may have been embezzling money, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, he may have. And yeah. like we don't they certainly, know. they certainly accused him of that. <laughs> yeah, someone is saying he's doing it. And and yeah. first Corinthians nine, he's trying to like, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. I don't want your money, but they can get money, but I'm not yeah. asking for it. And then yeah. he missed he like uses the Hebrew Bible out of context to point, uh, don't muzzle an oxen. It's talking about me. Yeah. Uh, but I love, I love Paul. <laughs> I love Paul too. He's yeah, so he, human. <laughs> yeah. He's such a human guy and he's such a, uh, yeah, people, people love to hate him, but I, I also have this sort of, uh, you know, love hate relationship with him where I, I, yeah, I just, you know, you know, I've, I'm sure folks have seen the bumper stickers that have the Bible verse on the bumper sticker, like John three sixteen. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to get the one from whatever it is. First, second Peter. That's just where Paul says, and don't trust Alexander, the coppersmith. <laughs> uh, I want to get second Peter, not, you know, 16, eight or whatever, put on a bumper sticker. So. Oh um, gosh. Uh, or whatever, you know, I left my coat there. Make sure you hold on to it. I love that. Uh, those, those lines, but. I just yeah. kind of took this approach though, just on Mark and it, what makes one an apostle according to Paul is that they had a vision, the appearance of Jesus. And in Mark, they don't get any appearances. Jesus right. never appears to them and they never get it. And I wonder if this is a jab and saying, you know, the real apostle, the one he appeared to was Paul. Yes, yeah, me. Yeah, it's Paul. not the 12. And <clears throat> it, it made me think maybe this is what Mark's up to. It's it's a guess. But yeah, have you ever seen the the there's another alternative? You know, there's the three famous alternative endings to Mark that are printed in most Bibles or at least most reputable Bibles. But, you know, there's another ending that was discovered in a Coptic manuscript. Um, oh, what's the name of that manuscript? It was all the rage in the early 20th century, uh, and now it's slipping my mind. But it, it gives another ending that's completely mm. unique uh, to Mark. And that, um, that now the name of that that Coptic gospel is slipping my mind. But I'll send it to you later. But uh, it also gives a whole another skew on it, and it's actually even more terrifying. Uh, it really focuses on the terrified part. Um, mm. I think uh, I had a uh, what is this, uh, Doctor Ian Mills on, and Ian Mills. Uh, he he pointed out there's I think there might be even more than four. Yeah, I think, I think there probably is. And I mean, as much as as much as there is any ending, it could just be that the manuscript broke off. I mean, that's what happens in papyrus manuscripts is that the, the beginning and the end are the parts that are going to get damaged the most because of the rolling. And so, right. uh, depending on how you roll it, the beginning and ending are the most manuscripts are lost. Uh, I know that because I've copied out an entire uh, papyrus manuscript by hand. Uh, just to see what it was like. Um, I copied wow. out the entire first book of Aristotle's Metaphysics by hand and on in ancient Greek on papyrus, just to see sort of what it was like to do it and what kind of mistakes get made. And uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we took a zoom into the New Testament here. Yeah. Um, so backing up and going sure. into just esotericism, period, what were some of the early actual like institutions where this was the case? I've heard there were mysteries even in Osiris cults uh, and this, especially when like Serapis is on the scene and various mm -hmm. other deities. Can you tell us about early institutions where esotericism was systematically a thing? Of course. I think in any religious setting, it was a thing, whether that's early Christianity or the, the, the situation, for instance, in the ancient Egyptian priestly caste, 
so for instance, one of the really interesting documents that survived from ancient Egypt is probably an, an initiatory document describing how one became a priest in ancient Egypt. This is sometimes referred to as the Demotic Book of Toth, uh, which I've, I've done an episode about, and it's incredibly weird. Um, uh, it's just a very strange book. So I would say that they <laughs> that I deal with a lot of weird books. I should just not say that. It just goes without saying at this point. Um, but I think that they, I think that those institutions were probably pretty early on. I think that some of the earliest places we see them is going to be in the Alexandrine context, where in Alexandria, it seems like there were distinct groups who had a vested interest in maintaining a high level of secrecy and initiation into their circles. I'm thinking of the Gnostics, I'm thinking of the Hermeticists, um, who are, uh, their documents, the Corpus Hermeticum is going to have a huge impact in the, the Renaissance and the foundations of modern esotericism, modern occultism. Um, even in the case of certain forms of Christianity, Gnosticism specifically, right, there's a, there's a clear idea that there are the insiders and the outsiders and, you know, we're the ones that know and you're the ones that don't. Um, so that's a, a case as well. And it seems like, uh, and we can see that, by the way, even among various Gnostic sects, because they're arguing with each other. We see in Nagamati that uh, not only are the proto-Orthodox Christians, you know, given the Gnostics grief, but even other Gnostics are claiming, you know, you don't know, no, you don't know. Um, which I really love the idea of internostic uh, beef. <laughs> um, and also, uh, even with a, a school like the School of Plotinus that was founded in the, in the third century there in Rome, uh, Plotinus also makes it very clear that he's not being completely transparent about his exact system. And so there's always this moment where we can't quite know what some of these philosophers are thinking because they're not quite telling us the truth. And there's an entire history, by the way, of what we call esoteric writing where philosophers, uh, scientists, occultists, uh, religious people will write a document putting forward, ostensibly putting forward their beliefs. And then between the lines, they're communicating to us, they're not telling us the truth. And the most famous example of that is Maimonides, the guide of the perplexed, perhaps the most important work in Jewish philosophy ever written. Maimonides just comes right out and says, just so you know, I'm not telling you the truth about what I really believe. And some of the things I'm writing in here aren't really what I believe and they're wrong and you have to figure out what's really true. Oh, wow. And so you're like, wow, damn it, Maimonides. <laughs> <laughs> this book is hard enough as it is, brother. Like, why do you got to make it harder? And so there's a long history of this, of, of, uh, of hiding things in plain sight. And of course, the most famous example, at least in the Christian context, is the, is the apocalypse, where clearly this is a example of what is called ex eventu prophecy. It's prophecy that's happening now, but you describe it as if it's happening in the future in an encoded way, because you're not going to write a book saying, well, Nero is crappy and I hate the Roman Empire because, you know, you don't want to end up like your leader. So what do you do? You encode it and you make it sound like it's going to happen in the future. And so the apocalyptic genre, whether it's Enoch, the, the, the apocalypse of John, the dozens of other apocalypses that are written, that some of the stuff in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You're not going to come out as a, as the Essenes and write, oh, the Romans are bad. Let's go fight the Romans. And God hates the Romans. going to defeat them. You're going to say, woe to the Kittim. Or gonna, Esau. You might code them yeah, in the name. Yeah, Edomites. Yeah. It's Edomites. the Edomites. It's the Kittim or whatever. So this form of esoteric writing is endemic in the ancient world. And by the time of the Second Temple period and, and the centuries that follow, it sort of gets legs and it gets repeated over and over and over again. And you find this sort of, uh, again... How do you say something and yet not? And that's that esoteric writing bit. And we see it happen over and over again with a, a wide variety of, of texts. Um, and not just that, once Christianity becomes an institutional religion in the fourth century, uh, Christianity has the ability not just to declare you a heretic, it has the ability to declare you as a criminal because you're a heretic. And therefore, a lot of practices that would have otherwise not been tolerated is not the right word, but the Christians just didn't have the political power to kill people for doing what they didn't like. Well, in the fourth century, they begin to get that kind of power. And what ends up happening are technologies that would make the Christians nervous go underground. This would, for instance, be magic. Hmm. And so we see magic kind of go underground, but it never goes away. And in fact, the one of the many dirty secrets or not so dirty secrets of the medieval world is that the vast majority of practitioners of black magic in the Middle Ages were priests. Uh, and, and, and when you think about that for a minute, it makes total sense. Who knows how to do the liturgy? Who knows how to read Latin? Who knows how to do the rituals associated with things like exorcisms? 
the only people with that skill set are going to be priests, the literate population. So who's writing all these medieval necromancers manuals? It's some people in the church. And Ooh. so this is where, again, we have this weird interplay where the church is actively suppressing things. And at the same time, they're only surviving because they can sort of live in the coattails of the church. So this is what this weird interplay of how what's acceptable and what's forbidden are always working together in some very strange ways throughout time. And we see this really in a very powerful way, for instance, in the Christian Middle Ages. If we're contrasting esoteric and exoteric, right. what is the difference? <laughs> and can you tell me some practices of esotericism that we now know or that we find out? You talk about one of the guys who kind of told the secrets and everybody hated him for it. What were those practices? What did they include versus an exoteric practice? Can you kind of paint uh, a black and white image so we could see a contrast? Great. I think so. I, I, I think an instructive example would be something like exorcism. Exorcism, as weird as it is, is exoteric, which is to say it's officially sanctioned by the church. It's a thing that any person, even in low orders, can do. In fact, uh, many priests in low orders in the Middle Ages would actually make their living as exorcists. It was a kind of a, it's kind of the, I don't know, the proletarian job of priests driving out demons. Um, uh, so it, that is an exoteric practice, which is to say it was sanctioned by the church. There were rituals for doing it. The Roman ritual is still done. In fact, there are more exorcists in dioceses now than there ever has been. Uh, the amount of exorcisms in the world uh, among Jews, Christians, and Muslims is going up at a very strong pace, oddly enough. Um, mm. th yeah, there are more demons out there. In fact, there's been an outbreak recently of exorcisms in the Jewish world, which is a really fascinating thing that you can get into if you want. Um, so that's a, that's an exoteric element, even though it has to do with demons, right? It's something that you're you're casting demons out of people. The power of Christ compels you. Um, we've all seen the movie oh, with yeah. the pea soup. Um, <laughs> so what's the esoteric dimension? Well, if it's the case that you are a priest and you have been brought into the priesthood, into the Catholic priesthood, you at some level have, at least by extension, the same kind of power that Peter had. And what does famously Peter have the power of? Whatever is in heaven, he can bind in heaven. Whatever is on earth, he can bind on the earth. And so the idea is Catholic priests in the Middle Ages had unique sets of powers. Well, if you could throw a demon out of someone with the right evocations and invocations and incantations and, you know, well, couldn't you also bind those demons? And if you could bind them, you could also control them. And what could you control them to do? Well, what do demons know? They know all kinds of weird secrets. They have all kinds of powers. They have all kinds of weird stations in the universe where there might be a demon specifically associated with the planet Mars. And that, that was a, a demon of hatred and uh, murder. And you might be able to wield that demonic power because you as a priest have the ability to control these beings because you have access to this holy power. You can control them the same way you might control a wild animal. And then you could unleash holy hell, literally, on other people. Or you can make people fall in love with you or find buried treasure. There's a wide panoply of things that one could do with these demons. That's an esoteric practice. Because uh, the idea is, at what point, right, do you cross the line to making deals with demons? At what point do you cross the line from controlling them to maybe they're controlling you? And this is what Augustine always famously says, that anytime anyone thinks they're controlling a demon, the demon's just playing them. And eventually they're going to, you know, kill their soul or what have you whatever demons do to people. Um, and so that's clearly an esoteric practice. And we would call that practice of binding demons. It's encoded in a book that se uh, several, many books that we have uh, called the Key of Solomon. There's a 150 different manuscripts of this medieval book of black magic where priests basically ostensibly were learning to bind and control demons. Now, clearly you don't go to seminary and get that lesson. <laughs> and you definitely don't go to seminary and teach that lesson. And we know of at least a couple of people who skirted that line and they got burned. Uh, Cecco d'Ascoli is a famous example in the 14th century. So that's a good example of an esoteric practice. You're not gonna go into your local church and local bishop or whatever and say, hey, Bishop so-and-so, I uh, summoned a demon last night, is that cool? He's gonna be like, hell no, it's not cool. What the hell is wrong with you? Um, but you and your friends might be doing it. And it might be the kind of thing that many of you are doing. And we have good reason to believe that many of them were doing it, because we have hundreds of manuscripts of people doing this stuff in the Middle Ages. 
So that's mm -hmm. a good example of an esoteric practice. So we have demon control. There's exoteric demon control and there's esoteric demon control. And we have plenty of evidence for both. Wow. So there's kind of a fine line sometimes between both. Yeah. It, it is a very weird thing. I, I also have heard, I don't know much about this, but I'm jumping into the future a bit to the Kabbalah. Yeah. And I've heard some conspiracies about this. And, and there are people who think that there's this teaching in the Kabbalah that's trying, you're going to get where I'm going with this. And maybe you could do a little defense for me here, mm -hmm. that there's a secret teaching that Jews want to take over the world and kill everyone who doesn't come and convert to their belief system, something like that. Um, I've been told by people that's anti-Semitism probably cloaked to try and paint this image. Mm -hmm. That is a misunderstanding ultimately of what's going on in Kabbalah. Can you help me out here? I'm sure yeah. you've read and you understand where I'm coming from with this. I don't know anything about the Kabbalah. So. Yeah. So I'll, the, the Kabbalah is a collection of a form of esoteric Judaism that emerged primarily in the 13th century, mostly in um, Spain and, 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 and Southern France. Um, there's nothing in the Kabbalah that has the idea that Jews are going to secretly try to take over the world or anything like that. Now, what we do find in the Kabbalah is a pretty antagonistic attitude toward non-Jews. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I read a lot of those texts and I don't like them. They make me feel really gross because I don't like the idea of my non-Jewish brothers and sisters being described in, in, really gross, in, really, in really unfair ways. But... And this is where I'll, I'll, I'll offer a slight defense of it. There are also Jews living in the 13th century in Europe who aren't exactly having the best time of their life living under Christian rule. Mm -hmm. And so often when an oppressed people want to get back, get back at their oppressor, they just can't go revolt. I mean, yeah. what would happen if a bunch of Jews in Spain revolted against the Christians? They get slaughtered. So what do they do? They sublimate that rage into literature. And that rage, in many ways, gets sublimated into some elements of the Kabbalah, not all of the Kabbalah, but in some elements of the Kabbalah, and that becomes a deep distrust and a disdain for the non-Jewish uh, non world. Now, to be clear, the Kabbalah also really dislikes Jews who aren't religious, who aren't scrupulously religious the way they think they should be. Right. So, so trust me, they, they paint a, with a broad brush of people they don't like. Um, and I think it's also really important for folks to understand about, for instance, the Talmud or other Jewish documents, mm -hmm. is that what you get in the Talmud and what you get in the Zohar aren't systematic treaties about what Jews should and shouldn't believe. They're records of conversations. And uh, as I'm sure you, you know, if you got a bunch of your friends together at the, at the dinner table or at the bar or whatever, and you began to have conversations, you're going to have that one friend who has a lot of fringe beliefs. And if you pick out just the, the card of the conversation with the friend with the wrench for the fringe beliefs and paint him as if he's the authority over every, all your friends, that clearly misrepresents your entire friend group. And so what can happen is that people can go into the Talmud or go into the Zohar, which is a, the main text of Kabbalah, and they can pick out the most fringe beliefs. And then and, and most of these people are doing this are anti-Semites. Then they can take those fringe beliefs and say, well, this is Kabbalah. This is the Talmud. And it's in the same way that you could take the Hebrew Bible, there's all kinds of terrifying things in there. Blessed are those that smash the head of children against rocks. Uh, if you just take verses like that out of the Hebrew Bible or the idea of karet, you just slaughter everyone in the book of Joshua, which of course never happened. It was a weird fantasy on the part of the writer that they wish it would have happened perhaps. But if you paint with a broad brush like that, you get a misrepresentation of what Kabbalah is and you get a misrepresentation of what the Talmud is. So it's important for folks to realize that Jewish texts tend to be records of conversations, not systematic treaties. Right. So it's so one way of contrasting this would be something like, and these are actually contemporary documents, the Zohar is being written as the center point of Kabbalah in the 13th century, and Thomas Aquinas is writing the Summa Theologica just across the border there in Paris. Thomas is writing a systematic treaties. The Kabbalah is a, is a system of conversations. And so in the system of conversations, you're going to, you're going to get a wide range of beliefs. So no, there's nothing in there that's, it, it's sort of, I've heard this too, and it's sort of, uh, what's the right way of putting it? It's a variation on a theme of the protocols of the elders of Zion, really. Um, it's just the midi, it's just people who believe that conspiratorial idea about uh, Jews just broadcasting that back into the past. And the truth of the matter is that the, the Zohar has just only recently been completely translated to English, so I can't imagine they've they've read the whole thing. 
there i've heard some jews actually still use like something of the kabbalah kabbalah uh in their in their like speeches today about non-jews and things like that from what i heard there are clips so obviously not all jews think alike but there is no conspiracy technically to take over the world um but at the same time there is this belief that one day you know our god is going to have us win uh, sure the, yeah. So this and, there, idea... and there are really gross parts in the Talmud where it says that when God, when the Messiah comes, all the non-Jews will be enslaved to the Jews. That's one guy's opinion. It's really yeah. important to note that's one guy's opinion. And there are people in the Talmud say, no, that's not what's going to happen. Um, and how the hell do you know what's going to happen? Right. Um, so, yeah, yeah, there are definitely a wide range. There's some gross stuff in the Talmud. I won't deny it. Uh, but I think, again, it's important to realize that the Talmud is a collection of, of, of conversations that stretched over a period of 500 years. And in a, any conversation stretching over 500 years, you're going to get some pretty fringe people. So th uh, there's this fine line between I've got a friend of mine who talks about a lot of the Jewish stuff that goes on. And he he's he's been in trouble before, actually, for posting about stuff in Jew, Jewish thoughts. And the problem was is is they're viewing him as an anti-Semite, but he's also pointing out these bad problems and going like, why is this, you know, rabbi over here actually preaching this right now? <clears throat> Some of these ideas. And he's trying to like kind of do a harm reduction, like kind of like I deal with fundamentalist Christians where they teach certain ideas that don't look good. How do you feel about that? <laughs> How do you feel about people who are trying to like go after and show like the flaws in Jewish teachings or Christian teachings, you name it, but the problem is, is these, this is an ethno group, whereas mm -hmm. you're dealing with just kind of a religious group over here. The sensitivity is a lot different, especially in light of what's happened in the 20th century. Sure. And I, so I think that I would say two things. One is if you put your sermons out there and you say messed up stuff, sorry, not sorry. If someone calls you out on it, like that's not cancel culture. That's just, you got to take responsibility for what you say. Right. And so if, if a, if a rabbi is out there saying, racist messed up stuff about non-jews well, i don't have any pity for for them if they get called out on it mm -hmm. um so that's one part of it the other part of it is yeah there is a history of of uh of bad actors in the jewish community being made to represent the entire community and not giving ammo to anti-semitism so yeah it is a fine line and it is a difficult thing to it is a difficult line to walk and i think that what people have to come to understand is that uh, the Taliban doesn't represent Islam, Haredi Judaism doesn't represent all of, uh, of, 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 of Judaism, and the Ku Klux Klan doesn't represent all of Christianity. Right. And if we, and if we, if we, if we allow that, I think it's a tragedy, if we, if we allow that to be representative, then we're not really telling the complex picture about these religions. Um, so yeah, when I hear Haredi, black hat, you know, I, I was in yeshiva for a while in the in the in the uh, Orthodox Jewish world, and I heard enough of it, and I had to leave. I just like I'm tired of anti-science yeah. stuff. I'm tired of of uh, of stuff being said about non-Jews. Um, you know, things like non-Jews don't have all the souls that one have, and I'm like, this is gross. I'm not getting with this. And mm. so, yeah, I don't have any patience for it. And I think that, uh, and I think the problem that might be is when a non-Jew calls out a Jew. I think the Jewish community is going to be worried about that just because yeah. there's a real power asymmetry. You know, you're talking about Jews represent less than 1% of the population of the world. You know, there's more Sikhs in the world than Jews. That's often a very difficult thing for Christians to understand because they don't know what Sikhs are hardly. Yeah. But, you know, you're, you're talking about a very tiny population who's been subject to some pretty severe trauma over the past couple thousand years. And so unsurprisingly, they're a bit nervous. Wow. Well, thank you for taking us into that. Yeah. I kind of was wondering like what this esotericism thing is and, and correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't Pythagorean uh, thought also esoteric or is there something sure. in this that's esoteric? It, not only, not only is it esoteric, but it's, um, it's so esoteric that uh, when folks may know this, who are watching that the Pythagoreans believe that, uh, that reality was number, that numbers were fundamentally what everything around you is actually just numbers. And one of their members actually discovered irrational numbers. And this so devastated the Pythagoreans that they assassinated him. What? It, it was, it, oh, yeah. It was a cult. It was a yeah. cult in the, in the sort of the classic, like, cult, you know, you know, cult sense. So they killed the guy um, over the, his discovery of irrational numbers because they did not want the idea that the, the universe could be in any way irrational. <laughs> 
they wanted a perfectly <laughs> harmonized universe. So, you know, you just murder a guy when he, so, so, and also it's worth pointing out that it seems very likely that the secret teachings of Plato were probably Pythagorean in nature. Um, there's, I can get into why we believe that, but we're fairly confident that Plato um, incorporated Pythagorean teachings and that was the secret core of his belief system. So absolutely, yeah, Pythagorean, they had a lodge in Southern Italy that the local people there were so terrified of them that they burned it down. They had a secret club uh, there in, their, in, uh, in Southern Italy. And eventually they just got, they just got burned out uh, because the locals there were just so freaked out by them. Wow. Um, and so, yeah. So in many ways, yeah, Pythagoreanism has a lot of like, it's not just a philosophy. There's also a religious practice where uh, they believed in reincarnation. They didn't eat beans. Apparently they didn't eat, uh, they kept a vegetarian diet. Um, we don't know a ton about them because a lot of it's been hidden because it, it was esoteric, but yeah, <laughs> they, they were off the chain. I mean, murdering people for, uh, for, for, leaking the leaking the 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 nasty truth about irrational numbers i've heard too the counting of the 513 fish in the jesus story when they cast the net and they count and somebody counted them or else they wouldn't know the number uh is kind of somehow showing an awareness of pythagorean story or something to that do you know anything about this I haven't heard that story. No. I mean, anytime I see numbers in the, in the Bible, I'm always convinced that there's some kind of what we call gematria underneath the hood of it. Right. Gematria is just the fact that you can take uh, Hebrew and Greek, then the, the individual no, uh, letters of Hebrew and Greek stand for numbers. They had no separate counting system. And typically numbers are almost always doing some kind of double duty symbolically. Now mm -hmm. the problem, of course, is they get badly corrupt as manuscripts go from one to the other. The most famous example is uh, the number of the beast where the early manuscripts have 616, but the later manuscripts have 666. Um, and so, and it's pretty clear that that probably is a code for, for Nero. Right. Um, and so that's an example where, again, you're hiding things in plain sight, that if you know it's Nero, then you, 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 you know that 666, 616 or 666 is Nero. But if you don't know, it's really mysterious, and then you make left behind books about it or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that, that specific situation I was talking about where he says cast the net on the other side of the boat and they catch all these fish, they count them as 513. 513 is actually a, a triangular number. And so if you take like 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 all the way to 19, you're at 513. Interesting. So yeah, you, and then it even gets even weirder. 513, if you shift the numbers around and you like do 315 plus uh, 351, it's 666 and you could do that two different ways it's just a strange thing but yeah you know, that that whole thing of you know one plus two is three then three plus four is this if you do it all you know, if you add one plus two plus three plus four you get ten that symbol that triangular symbol was a sacred symbol in pythagoreanism called the tetricus hmm. um so it could be it could be you know the people that wrote these books were smart in their own way and they were they had a literary flair and it's certainly the case that they were no one's going to pick a number out of a hat at that yeah. time, right? And, and no one caught, and, and no one's counting those fish. So the number is a literary invention that almost certainly is uh, important. I'd be interested, curious to see in the history of the papyrological uh, record if that number is, is it, if, it, if it's stable. Right. Um, what do the sources actually say? Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if it's stable, because a lot of these numbers often become highly unstable. Uh, especially in the Hebrew Bible, you get a lot of instability in numbers and ditto in the New Testament. The 616, 666 thing is a pretty classic example where the uh, manuscript record clearly adopted a later uh, number as opposed to most early manuscripts don't have 666. Yeah, really interesting stuff. I just figured I'd throw it out there. So Plato, um, how does this impact Christianity as far as you could tell? This is my last question. And I want to do this again, of course. This has been a blast. Sure. There's so much to discuss. We're just trying to crack, crack the surface here. I asked because I came out of Christianity, so it's obviously a very interesting area for me. As far as Plato and this esoteric rooted idea, how much impact did the philosophy of that have on, let's say, Paul? Paul, it's hard to say. I mean, he's a bit of an enigma in terms of his educational background. He, he, he makes a lot of claims about his educational background, but one, one doubts them. I, I do, at least, that he mm -hmm. really set at the feet of Gamaliel or whatever. Um, it's so difficult to tease out. And I've, I've been asked this question before about to what degree do we think Paul is educated in, in both Jewish classical education that a rabbi would have gotten at that time, but also Greek education. 
because it's clear that he wants to he wants to put forward that he has some education, right? The famous debate in Acts where he debates the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers and says, no, the unknown God is in fact uh, uh, the God. So he, it's clear that the, the text of Acts wants you to believe that Paul has this education. But when I read through the, the letters that we think are Paul, right? The seven mm -hmm. letters that we think really were written by, and there's debate still about if all those seven are really written by him. I don't see a highly trained philosophical mind. I see someone, and the tools you would have had access to would have been Stoicism, Platonism, specifically a, a form, of, a system of thought we now call Middle Platonism. Um, people like Numenius and things like this. And when I read Numenius, or when I read people from the Middle Platonic period, that you know, you know Philo, you know, something quasi like Philo, mm -hmm. um, the kind they were both, you know, ish contemporary ish. Um, I don't see that in Paul. And what I see in Paul is a very confused man. And, and I can mean confused in the best possible way, in the sense that he's had some incredible, powerful vision, right? And he has to make sense of it. And what I see in those letters is him trying to basically build a ship at sea, building this theology and testing out ideas, seeing what works and what doesn't. You know, I, I often say that, look, you can see in, in the, for me in the New Testament, you can see different theories of salvation. It's not like there's even one worked out theory. There's the right. ransom theory, and then the ransom theory is abandoned for this atonement theory, and the atonement theory has to kind of get jiggered around to make it work. Um, so what I see in Paul is a kind of theological amateur doing a really ingenious thing, and that's this shift away from the, the Messiah that redeems the world politically to a Messiah that fixes a spiritual problem that began with Adam. So he sort of moved the goalpost of Messiah in a really ingenious way, but I don't see any need, at least for Paul, to, have to, to have incorporated a bunch of middle platonic thought to make that happen. Now, that's completely to be contrasted with someone like Justin Martyr or, the, or Valentinus, the founder of Valentinian Gnosticism, where, or Irenaeus for that matter, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Valentinus, they rely heavily on middle platonism and, and to make their systems work. And there I see where Christianity really gets its sort of intellectual sea legs. And of course, I, and I've made this argument before that the Trinity is unimaginable without, in fact, I would consider the Trinity the crowning jewel of Greek philosophy. You have to bring to bear Platonism, Aristotelianism, Stoicism, the whole Megillah to make the Trinity work, to make right. it coherently, the Trinitarian economics work. And so I would say that you don't see the intellectual, um, explosion in Christianity, at least not for me, until the second century. Um, it's, it's then, I think, that when that, when, when that really gets going. But I don't see it in Paul. He's genius, but he's not a genius that's, that's informed by the kind of conversations happening in, the, in, in Middle Platonism. Does it sound like he knows something, um, uh, levels of heaven, um, First Corinthians 15, like different bodies with different flesh. It sounds like he yeah. knows something, but like you're saying, knowing something, plenty of people knew something. Right. The, he, he you're was... saying there's a level that he's not quite at with these other people who really uh, make the golden standard something like, oh, this I is a so. real thinker. Okay. I think so. And I think that, the, the, for instance, that example in, in Corinthians, right, where he's caught up to the third heaven, which is interesting because he says he knows a guy. And of course, it's probably him. <laughs> Um, I, I love, I know a guy You're like, hey, yeah, I know a guy who does drugs. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, a guy, Paul. Um, yeah, so, yeah like, <laughs> I know that guy too. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that moment in, in Corinthians where he says he was caught to the third heaven. Um, you may know this and folks in the, in the audience may know it as well, that that's probably a reference to a form of Jewish esotericism called Merkava mysticism that existed at that time for which we have texts. We have actually a substantial amount of literature that survived wow. in which we have depictions and descriptions of the rabbis. And there's a famous story in the Talmud that recounts this as well, where the rabbis are actually descending into the palaces of God and then describing these palaces until they enter into the private throne room of God and they're given a glimpse of the body of God. And they describe God um, the body parts of God, but not only the body parts of God, but the dimensions of God's body, the literal measurements between God's <laughs> eyebrows or the length of God's beard. And this literature is, is called the Shio Koma literature. I'm not, it survives. Wow. We still have it. 
God's beard's 14,000 feet long or so, as you'd imagine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's That makes sense. You know that I mean? makes total sense. Uh, I'm working on mine. I'm still <laughs> like... Um, but this this Merkava literature, um, we know was being practiced. We have references to it in the in the in the uh, in the Talmud. We have literature that survived. It was written by the people who did this form of mysticism. Um, of course, it was never public, right? It was always a secret thing that these rabbis did. But that weird oblique reference to Paul actually tells me that he may have been part of those circles of folks uh, doing this kind of mystical enterprise. And unsurprisingly, if he's having visions of descending into the throne. Of the throne room of God or into the Merkava, the Hechalot of the divine, it's not surprising he's not, kind of, he's not he's, that he's going to have other kinds of visions as well. And the vision he had of, of Jesus uh, famously may have been um, emergent from this Merkava mysticism. Yeah, things that are unlawful to say he talks about. And it makes me yeah. wonder it with his, his Torah ideas that it's like, Maybe he's envisioning something that also fits his program with Gentiles quite well with that money. Uh, it's hard to know because people go, oh, he's a con man. And then others go, no, he's just a lunatic nutcase religious guy. And it's like, no, he might be both or he might have a little both tendencies. I yeah, don't, you know, I don't think not- either, actually. I don't see him as a con man or as a, as a, as a, as a, as a unstable person because I think that unstable people would not be able to do what he did, which okay. is probably the greatest – marketing campaign of an idea ever um and he held together communities i mean I, i've seen unstable mentally unstable people they're not holding themselves together much right. less entire communities of people all the way through asia minor so one i just well i'm unsta- thinking like a jim jonesy type of like a it could be i mean jim jones was highly unstable toward the end especially when you yeah. got into all the meth but that's what <laughs> I knew Never a guy once. who once did uh, meth yeah, and uh... yeah, he did meth and founded a community <laughs> in Guyana. It went sideways. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see Paul as unstable. I see him as a kind of genius who's, who's coming to grips with something that he his it broke his mind, and he's put it, he's put it, he's trying to put it back together, and he's trying to put it back together in a way that he thinks is going to make sense for everybody. Because I think that the vision he had is a radi- a vision of radical spiritual inclusion. And on the one hand, people, you know, yeah, like, I mean, yeah, I, I just don't buy the con man thing. Yeah. And also, I just think that, um, that you know, James and the community back in Jerusalem had every reason to doubt this dude. He didn't know Jesus. He has this vision and vanishes for some amount of time. Um, and then he kind of shows up and tells everyone how to run the show. And I can imagine the people that knew Jesus being like, the hell do you know? who are you you're some guy yeah so yeah i mean i don't know i've never i've never gotten the con man argument and again there's some people that want to say oh he twists the hebrew bible to to get what he wants i'm like have you read the mishnah like have you read the talmud did yeah who didn't do that that's just i actually how... was reading uh our, i can't remember the name of one of the rabbis but i'm reading a book jews and the roman rivals i got it somewhere over here yeah. anyway it's on the history because i have this weird interest of finding out in history when non-jews which i will equate as non-israelites whatsoever because there's some groups out there that think well an israelite from the northern kingdom is a non-jew and they they have this like wild idea i'm sure technically technically yes so are benjaminites and simeonites and yeah right you can get all technical but a non-jew being a non-israelite at what point did a pagan with no genealogical tie, get called Abraham's descendant or being a child of Abraham. And the rabbis had this wrestling match going on. One of them said, when they brought this to him as a convert, they said, no, you can't say the prayer in Deuteronomy 25, where it's the God of our fathers. You could say the right. God of your fathers, but not ours. Then another rabbi goes, have you not read the scripture? And then he says, God or Abraham's name means standing or Abram means standing father or something like this. And then he says, but his name will be called Abraham for he will be the father of many goyim. And what is a goyim? Uh, Well, this non-Israelite. And so a different time where the word goyim is now obviously applied to people who are not Israelites exclusively, it seems for the most part, that is where you would designate the category for goyim. I thank you, God, that I was not born a woman. And I thank you that I was not born a goy. So this right. idea, you know, that there's this insider outsider idea, rather than it just being generically used as a nationalistic 
nation. It just, it just means nation, yeah. Right. And that term takes on its own meaning. Like or Orlegoyim, right? Or Orlegoyim means the light to the nations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. but that there's people who want to take that strict, like that general term and apply it throughout all history and don't realize, like, yeah, no. Words this... change their meaning. Yeah, again, if I told you 100 years ago, let's go be gay in the forest, that'd be a real different thing than it means now. <laughs> um, I won't do a guy, though. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that guy, too. Uh, but yeah, like, again, the, when we, when we, yeah, when we, the part of the rabbinical genius is how they manipulate these texts to get them to say what they want them to say. That's kind of yeah. what religions do. I don't care if you're a Buddhist or a Muslim or whatever. The, the tafsir tradition isn't trying to tell you what the Quran really says. It's trying to tell you what I, as a tafsir writer, need the Quran to say. Um, so, yeah, the rabbis bend and twist and hafagbaba, uh, hafagbaba, right? Spin it, spin it, round and round. Any, any, anything can be found. Uh, two, rabbis, a rabbi. three, two rabbis, three opinions. Yeah, yeah, yeah this, you know, these, these classic things, right? Ben Haihe or whatever says this in the uh, Perkei Avos. So, yeah, I mean, like, but again, to go back to Paul, people say this about Paul. Oh, Paul manipulated the scriptures out of context to blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, that's rabbinical Judaism, bro. Like, that's what they did. That's how they salvaged a religion in the aftermath of the destruction of the temple was by altering the religion, by understanding the Hebrew Bible in a way that didn't need the temple anymore, at least for a little while. Yeah. You so, don't need sacrifices. Uh, God didn't want sacrifices. Yeah, Look at we, this passage, you know. Right, and it's needs like, prayers, prayers and good works. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't people. And again, I see my, some of my fellow Jewish people, they lambast Paul and they say, Oh, Paul's blah, 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 blah. I'm like, no, he's just kind of doing what everyone did. And to, to single him out as uniquely malevolent. Um, it's just not, it's not, his, it's anachronistic. I think it, it, he does have a strange uh, idea about Jesus. There, there, it yeah. seems very r radically different than what you typically hear. But uh, I wish we had writings from the Jerusalem uh, to find out how their views were. Was he just a regular rabbi? You know, was he was Jesus just viewed as this? Was he viewed as a Messiah figure, kind of like what we see with Akiva, or we see um, what is it? Who, who's the rabbi in the um, the the war in one thirty? Was uh, it Kokba? But Kokba, yeah, yeah, but Kokba, yeah. yeah. And he was seen like that for a rap, uh, from rabbis. As well, a, yeah, of course, the Rabbi Akiva, the leading rabbi of the day, and of course, in the Talmud, it makes it very clear that Akiva believed he was a Messiah, and other rabbis said, "Akiva, grass will grow in your cheek, and the Son of David will not have come. You'll be dead in the ground, and there'll be no Messiah yet." And sadly, of course, Akiva did not die and was buried in the ground. He was burned alive by the Romans for supporting Bar Kokhba and the revolution. Wow. So, um, so yeah, he was wrapped in a Torah scroll and burned alive. Um, yeah, the Romans had a sense of, uh, man, the Romans broke it in, stuck it in and broke it off. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of messiahs around Thutis and Bar Kokhba, and there'll be other messiahs to come and Shabbat V and things like that. Um, and they were polarizing. And I think that even the Jesus movement, whatever messiah meant inside of the, the G early Jesus movement, I'm absolutely sure there was no unified belief apostolic succession about exactly what this meant. And we can see that because not even the Gospels can seem to figure out what it means. We have the gospel of love and the secret gospel, and we have this very Jewish redemptive gospel in Matthew, and you know, we have this very pro sort of Gentile gospel in Luke and Acts. Um, they're building a ship at sea, man, and and we shouldn't expect anything different than that. And to, and to fault them as if they're frauds for building a ship at sea after they've had this traumatic experience of having their leader executed and apparently some of them at least having visions of his resurrection, I'm not going to get in the business of throwing stones at those people. I don't want to condemn them or mock them. I want to understand them because when messiahs die, weird things happen. And this is a, a sociological, religious sociological mm -hmm. thing we have, we see happen over and over and over again. And the better we understand it to go back to our friend, Jim Jones, the better we can prevent things like that from happening. David yeah. Koresh, right? We need to understand the messianic worldview. And I think that, you know, writing Paul off as a nut job or whatever, or a con man, we're not, we're not, we're not only doing him a disservice, but he's not the last Paul. You know, yeah. the messianic impulse is still caked into Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And if we don't really understand that through history, we're going to be doomed to repeat all those kinds of mistakes. And I think, for instance, when I imagine, you know, the horrifying instance in Guyana or when uh, the Branch Davidian compound went up in flames, I think it's because we haven't learned the lesson about how to think about messiahs and try to take them seriously 
even if we don't take them literally. Yeah. I think those are very different things. And trying to understand the mind of yeah. people who are doing that's an interesting point. They yeah. they're functioning human beings who seem normal and and but just have these ideologies that uh, really, really grab them. This has been a very interesting talk. I really want to have you come back. I almost I was gonna ask you about speaking in tongues, what your thoughts were in this weird thing. Glossolalia, yeah. And not only that, but angelic languages. Uh, there's right. a lot of history of angelic languages that we actually have in, in esotericism, the most famous being the Enochian language, which is a language or allegedly revealed. Yeah, it has grammar, syntax, vocabulary, uh, allegedly revealed to a um, 16th century uh, occultist named Dr. Hmm. John Dee and his medium, Edward Kelly. It is hella weird. Yeah. Um, hella weird. But yeah, a topic for another day. But yeah, Derek, I'd love to come back on and uh, I'd love to hang out more and, and uh, yeah, chat. It's been really, oh, it's been a lot of fun. This has been a blast. Dr. Justin Sledge, everybody go check out his Esoterica Patreon. Go support him, especially once you watch some of his videos. And uh, he also has the YouTube channel. Be sure to check that out. Subscribe, hit that bell if you want to be an insider. If you want to remain exoteric, don't touch that bell right there next to the bell right there don't, don't touch, it. touch it it's only for the don't cool kids eat the fruit on the tree okay <laughs> and then also he has the website look i think he ate the fruit on the tree that day he got married so you know yeah. I kind of... <laughs> something like that yeah i think also... i interpreted it that way no. <laughs> what were you gonna oh, say brother Oh yeah, and also I one of the things I do is I also uh, have a small little business where I sell uh, uh, occult books from the from the from the Middle Ages. If you the Ex Libris uh, tab there, you can see some of the um, uh, books from the from the you know, late Middle Ages that I actually uh, deal in. So if you're interested in wow. real books of uh, occultism, real books of magic, actually printed in the 17th and 16th centuries, I also deal in those books, which is um, which is a lot of a lot of fun. You get oh into some get into some really cool stuff and and some of those books so that's awesome i did not know that you're a man of uh many trades here i seriously appreciate your knowledge what did you think about this episode let us know down in the comment section we went everywhere we didn't just focus on esotericism <laughs> but there's a I mean, it all like kind of interconnects in some way and you're going to find these things connect often. Watch his videos. And if you're a Myth Vision fan, come to me and let me know if you want anything specific of the videos that he talks about in the comment section. And me and uh, Dr. Sledge can talk about maybe doing another episode following up. I'd like to do these more with you because you just you just have a lot of insight in a lot of ways. I really do appreciate you joining here. Yeah, thank you, Derek. I really appreciate you having me on and uh, yeah, best of luck with the channel. And I'd love to come back and, and chat more. It's been a blast. Thank you. It really has. Everybody, go in the description right now. Go support my guest and never forget, we are Myth Vision. Ladies and gentlemen, join Myth Vision's Patreon not only to support us, but there are 72 videos that I did with Dr. Dennis R. McDonald and Richard Carrier, all on the Patreon, early access. You guys can ask personal questions when I go to interview these scholars, and you're helping Myth Vision grow.